Welcome to another Sermon Debrief uh, in the Walk Worthy podcast. We are continuing to work our way through the Ten Commandments, and this week we are on commandment number six. Uh, sometimes we read the sermon ta- passages uh, before we start this discussion so that what we heard in the sermon is most fresh on our minds, and uh, for the next few weeks is really not going to take that long. So Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. That was the uh, the sermon uh, one person said to me yesterday, you got all of that from two words. Uh, I think it was a compliment. I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, <laughs> right. um, it was uh, in Hebrew. It's only two words in English. It's four. And, uh, and Sean we, is we 20 spent, minutes. Yeah. Well, plus I think anyway. Um, so yeah, we are unpacking these. We could deal with them in one. You could deal with them in two because there's, you know, vertical horizontal, com- horizontal commands, but we are taking our time and I would say, maybe brothers can comment on this if you're seeing it or not, maybe it's just me. I think that people are surprised mm-hmm. at all of the different places that you legitimately should go when you're dealing with these commandments. And uh, I think, I hope, I pray that it is increasing people's appreciation for an Old Testament portion of Scripture. So I'm enjoying seeing that in the life of our church. Mm-hmm. I hope that's true for you if you're listening. When you preach a single verse in light of the entire Bible, there's a lot to say. There sure is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we usually begin, I'm just happy to hear from you brothers ways the Lord was using his word in your life because we believe unapologetically, unequivocally that God does his work through the word, by the spirit, in the church, for his glory. And that's why we preach it, read it, sing it, pray it. So... How was that true in your own personal lives from yesterday? A couple of cool moments uh, in the sermon that really stuck out to me were, A, when you were talking about that massive chapter in the Paulison book where he says, do you struggle, seriously struggle with anger? And the answer is yes, and the chapter ends. And I think that was profound because we tend to isolate ourselves when it comes to our sin, and we go, man, I I don't think the guy sitting next to me probably struggles as much as I do in this area, because you're so familiar with your own struggle and your own failures. And uh, and so, you know, everyone's sitting there, and we've heard the diagnosis, and we've, we've heard about, you know, how Jesus talks about this command not to murder in, in Matthew chapter 5, and we go, okay, guilty, guilty, guilty. The gavel goes down, and I am unrighteous. Mm-hmm. And and then, you know, for that statement to be made and for us to all recognize that we struggle with anger to one degree or another, um, but seriously nonetheless, um, is a helpful realization. And then as you worked your way through the section, it was really helpful, but then as you ended, um, it was a beautiful reminder to think about the fact that the hands that carried the Ten Commandments down the mountain were hands that had committed murder. Um, he had struck a rock in anger and was not uh, permitted to enter the promised land. And so here we have the the mediator of these commands, as it were, um, who is less than a perfect mediator. And what that points us to is the fact that we need the better mediator, Jesus That's Christ, right. who um, uh, was um, angry but did not sin. Right, um, and you know he he flipped temple uh, tables in the temple, but it was a righteous anger. He was angry that these people were uh, profaning profaning the name of the Lord, and uh, making a statement about uh, worship and about God that was uh, inaccurate and unhelpful. So, yeah, that those were two moments that especially stuck out to me. That's good. Building off of Caleb's comment there, I've been struck the whole series by the idea of the vertical and horizontal relationship and how in every commandment it would be really easy just to make it moralistic and to say, you can, you shall not murder, <laughs> like right? Like it's simple. And I was struck yesterday, especially by the way that you, just like Caleb was saying, it's vertical before it's horizontal. Um, you said in your in the middle that the fear of God and respect of his law, that needs to be there in order for it to result in love of neighbor, i.e. not murdering them, right? And so I was just helped to think the entire time of, yes, those, these are behavioral things, but ultimately they're vertical. 
um, where if our relationship with God is not restored, then our relationship with neighbor can never be right. So that was super helpful for me yesterday. That's good. Good reflections. Sergey, anything you want to add? Um, I think very useful the way you ruled out uh, what murder is not. Mm-hmm. I think that good. was helpful to understand uh, the text better, the context better. Um, I mean, the, nothing to add for that. Okay, that's good. good. It's a good commercial for, you know, you can, it's a good commercial for those who are regularly publicly handling the word of God to have some capacity in the original language. Mm-hmm. It's very helpful to be able to, oh, what does this term actually mean? And yeah, engage with commentaries for sure who are doing that work. But uh, I think our Hebrew professor that several of us have had is that you're not going to take a cheap nickel from a uh, wooden nickel from a commentary because you can actually do the work yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think there is some benefit to that, that someone somewhere in the life of the church is actually thinking about what is the original language, what is the meaning, uh, and doing some study on that to really, I think, bring clarity. So I found it super helpful uh, to dig into that. I'd never done it before, so it was super helpful. How long does it usually take you to translate a text oh. in a sermon prep? This last one? This last one? Three seconds. <laughs> did not take long. Uh, that really does depend on the length of a text, but usually on a Monday morning, if I'm dealing with like a chunk of text, I could probably spend a good, I don't know, 60, 90 minutes just working my way through. And I don't, I, like if I'm stuck on something, I don't, I'm not like cracking out like lexicons and grammars and those types of things. I, I'm, I'm benefiting from the use of software uh, for efficiency. But uh, I usually have translated everything on my own and uh, this slows me down, helps me to, uh, yeah, just I can read quick in English, can't read so quick in Hebrew or Greek. So it slows you down and you just notice things and I, I find it very helpful. So, mm. But yeah, 60, 90 minutes uh, on a first crack. And then we'll go from there. So, but this week, no, super, <laughs> super fast. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Any other comments, questions? Uh, there's a whole positive side of the law that I never touched on, the positive side of the command that I never touched on. We can come to uh, in, in a moment, but uh, I'm happy to hear any constructive criticism, godly criticism, questions. Or a comment. Uh, when it comes to th- this command in particular, it strikes me that as we did sort of the etymological work, so we looked at the word for murder, it becomes clear that you can't use the command as a justification for pacifism. Yeah, talk more mm. about that. Because the the word murder is never used of um, uh, war. Mm-hmm. It's never used of killing an animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were the other contexts that you mentioned? Uh, capital punishment. Yeah, capital and punishment self-defense. and self-defense. Yeah. So it would seem like to use then this commandment as a justification for pacifism would contradict what context the word actually means. So mm-hmm. your, your statement right at the beginning of the sermon, unauthorized, unauthorized. killing, mm-hmm. is very helpful. Now, uh, on that statement then, and maybe, I don't know, I don't want to, put you in a corner or anything like this. But were the First and Second World War authorized killing? That is a great question. I am not very well versed on just war right. in a theory. Um, I We will come to it because in, in Exodus, so right. I would say like yeah. let's put a placeholder there. Yeah. Um, the state, I do believe, based on Romans 13, has the... The sword, right? That's right. So there is an authority that God imbues the state with that they are to use. And uh, I would not be opposed to capital punishment, Mm -hmm. uh, tying um, Genesis 9, verse 6, I believe, uh, and the authority that that has been given to the state. uh, um, So there is a provision for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, yeah, I'd have to, uh, you know, War is never good. It's no. never something that you want right. to see happen. But in instances when it is employed for the stopping of even greater evils, hmm. it is at times necessary, yes. And so uh, when you think of something like uh, the, the the Great War, the Second World War in particular, 
uh, what was happening. Yeah, it seemed that there needed to be a deadly force utilized to stop what Hitler and the Nazis were doing. And so, yeah, there could be a, a, a case made there for this is a just war. Uh, grievous though war is, uh, it is a necessary necessary endeavor. So more on that to come. No, that's but, good. And, and you know what I was just thinking as I saw that wording, I was like, ah, how, you know, someone might ask the question, how how do we know if a war is sanctioned by God, like authorized, right? And I think it's helpful to then go to Romans 13 and say, well, the state has protective powers, yes. right? Uh, not the church uh, in these right. matters, but the state does, and it needs to exercise its protective powers to protect its citizens. So, hmm. yeah, no, that's helpful. And the, the challenge for the, I agree with you in terms of this commandment not being a foundation for pacifism, I my understanding as I've thought about that issue is that the challenge that you get into when you were dealing with things like just war, for example, is you may have had instances where you have Christian men fighting in World War II on Axis and allies and killing each other as brothers in Christ. Right. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's why someone's saying, the kingdom's not of this world, I'm not going to participate in that way. Um, so maybe it might be more conscientious, conscientious objection rather than pacifism per se, but that is a consideration that we have to take into account when Absolutely. we are thinking about the tragic realities of living in a sinful world. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But more on that to come based on what's future in Exodus. I thought it was really helpful in the sermon how uh, you broke down the the application. So you talked about how murder is prohibited as, as an action of our hands and then as an action of our hearts. As we went through the hands uh, section, it was you know fascinating to think about all the different, fascinating in a negative way, fascinating to think about all the different manifestations of this in society, physician assistance and death, um, there's abortion, there's straight out murder and crime and all those sorts of things. And for us to go, yeah, that's, you know, the, our, the justice piece of us um, rises up and we go, that's terrible, those are awful. And and they absolutely are. And to think about 270 babies um, being uh, killed mm-hmm. every single day in Canada, just, we're just talking Canada, and that's yes. those are the, that are reported. Um, just turns your stomach. And then to think about, you know, we are something like 10 years, a decade ahead of where Canada projected us to be with respect to physician assistance and death. I, it absolutely turns our stomach. And then for us to turn to, this is a prohibition of the heart as well. And I, I have to ask myself this question. Does it turn my stomach as much? Hmm. Great question. Right? And I, I think that that's um, perhaps a soul-searching question for all of us, anyone who's listening, myself included. Does my own anger, uh, the murder of the heart, do my own, you know, you, you talked about, you know, do you ever dream about getting even? Like, oh, I hate that guy. You know, I just want to punch the lights out of that mm-hmm. guy. That that guy needs to be humbled and know, you know, just how inferior he actually is. And am am I sickened by that sin in my heart, which has the potential? It might never get there, but it has the potential to spiral out of control to the point of physical murder with my hands. And even if it never does, it is out of control in in, in the scenario that it's a sin. And sin leads to more sin, and sin enslaves so anyways, that's just a thought that I've had as I've well, thought through the sermon. Yeah, great reflections. I, we should definitely be grieved by the way that life and image bearers and, and, and God are, are being treated, as it were, uh, with respect to the culture of death yes, in Canada. That should absolutely. grieve us. And uh, uh, there should be... There, there can be legitimate righteous anger about that also. Should be, yes. And uh, so I just want to affirm all of that. Yeah, we're not saying anything about that no. side of things. No, yeah, that yeah, is yeah, yeah. that is no. grievous. We should yeah. mourn. We should we should pray. Like you know, our our governing officials, lawmakers, and politicians, and they need to humble themselves. Like that, there's repentance mm-hmm. that is required. It's awful. And uh, you know, one sister said yesterday, "I wish this could be heard in Ottawa." Right, like there's just there's no fear of God uh, before mm. the eyes of our culture. We should grieve that, 
Uh, but I, I love what you're doing here too. And that the way to avoid, and I've heard, I can't remember who I heard put it this way. Um, like Phariseeism, like to be yeah. a Pharisee legalistic is you're harder on the sins of others than you are on yourself on your own. And so what you're talking about is no, I should be grieved first and foremost by the, my own sin mm-hmm. and actually more so in a way, like I'm harder on my own sin than I am on the sins of others that should that's a good ordering of things mm-hmm. uh there will be a whole lot more patience compassion uh, f- uh you know even when you're wanting to correct your opponents to do that with gentleness as paul writes to timothy that will be born out of uh seeing that no my sin is is greater i know my own sin more and i'm grieved more by what's going on in my own heart than i see what's going on in the world and i think that is the right order and posture uh, that doesn't diminish our anger and grief no. over the other sins that we're talking about here, but I do believe that is the place to start. So I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. That's where I'm thankful for the gospel um, balm that came at the end, where you where you talked about Moses, right, and said that it's God's redemptive work to call us into His grace and then to allow us to share in it and to share it, right? Mm. And I thought about those that us maybe especially felt condemned by. Um, what they were hearing and the fact that God calls us into his grace. And now you don't just even get to experience it. You get to share the fact that once we were like those people in Revelation 21, 8, right? But now we've been brought into the light and into life. And so we can go and live in that newness of life. So that was so helpful at the end of, yeah, a real checking of heart, um, especially after talking about the internal act of murder. So, yeah. That's good. Gospel stunning, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. What exists? Uh, can I ask this question? What exists? You haven't asked it yet, so I don't well, know. We'll see. <laughs> in <laughs> our hearts, here. what are what are instigators of anger <sighs> in the human life, this right? Is, in yeah, human great experience at, at large. So, so remember, these That's are not uh, the sin is in my uh, the sin is in my heart, right? These are not like wow, if, I I wouldn't sin with anger in this way if this thing hadn't provoked me. But okay, so like, where where does this come from? I think you mentioned it in the sermon when, uh, when we take a life of someone, we make ourselves God. But I think in our hearts is the same. We make ourselves God, and so we think we are in control. We think we get to say what it is. I mean, just think with kids. It's like, do this. No, no, no. You need to do it. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's like what? Come on. So I think that's the. That sin of, um, we think we're in control is the sin of everything resolve, we, of individualism. Everything resolve, revolves around us. And then when we don't get to dictate what it, the outcome, that drives us crazy because we lose that, um, we can't be God anymore. Mm-hmm. I think that's the, a lot of people think it's like that. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm, I'm going to go back to James 4 again, which yeah. was quoted in the sermon what causes quarrels and fights? Uh, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? So I think that's what you're describing, is that we think we're at the center of the universe, and if ever th- if if someone or something doesn't line up with that, then we're it's tantamount to murder. Like well, I, I I'm gonna you're in my way, get out of my way. Hmm. Because you're stopping me from getting this, or you're not helping me to get this, or so like get on board, or I'm gonna take you out. So with eight billion people on this earth that think exactly like that, <laughs> it's gonna yeah. cause a lot of issues. And That's it, right, and it, and it does. So yeah, there's a self-centeredness mm-hmm. there. There is just a craving, uh, a sinful nature that desires power. that which is evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, power, uh, idolatry pleasure like there's all sorts of do you have more you want to add or you have no, anything you want to touch on that's where i wanted to go so then i i feel like that helps us with a solution in the moment and after the moment right like the the bomb's been dropped of our anger and now we're like picking up from the devastation <laughs> and now how do we process what just took place i think what's really helpful is to ask this question uh like you sort of go oh i don't understand what just happened there i maybe i'm just really tired or maybe I was provoked, mm. or maybe, right? And so we come up with all External these excuses, excuses, right? And I think instead what we then need to ask, based on the answers that you guys gave, which are absolutely, I think, correct, is 
what did I want hmm. that I wasn't getting? It's a great question. And then, and then to work your way backwards from there. And then um, we're, we're angry at people often. Someone is the, the, the subject that receives our anger. The obstacle. Yeah. Usually, usually those who are closest to us bear the hardest brunt of our anger. So instead of saying, Sean, I need your forgiveness because I was angry at you. I need to say that. But I need to say, Sean, I need your forgiveness because I wanted such and such and you were an obstacle to that. Mm. Right? And 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 that really helps to I mean that <laughs> to even think about scenarios of that. Mm. I'm going, oh, that really humbles me. Mm. <laughs> but it helps, I think that's part of what it means to mortify the flesh, yes. to kill yeah. those things which are insidious mm. and poisonous inside of me. I find that the more accurate my request for forgiveness is, um, the harder it is to ask for forgiveness, mm. but then the more powerfully it kills mm. those desires Agreed. in me. I have, I have a personal sort of illustration comes to mind uh, to just maybe give some feet to what you're describing there. I remember one occasion where I we were, we were going out the door I had put on something and my wife said, I don't think that really matches. And I got really angry. And I, really not a big deal it, on the surface, right? Like what you're, and then I, I, yeah, that exercise, like why was I so angry? Because the approval of my wife matters so much to me, sometimes too much. And in that moment, I wasn't getting it over a stupid mm. thing. But it was nothing to do with what I was wearing matching or not. Mm -hmm. But it was like, oh, I just... It, it exposed something. It exposed other, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So usually there's the, the, yeah, it's what's under it, what's behind it, what's beneath it, what's the passion, what's the desire, what is it you want? And uh, yeah, I needed to ask her forgiveness for responding in anger, but also to talk about, I think this is why. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make it right. And not that there's like, you know, do I, do I want the encouragement of my wife? And uh, of course I do, but... More than holiness, more than treating her with, nah, that's an idol. That's a problem. That needs to be reordered. That needs to be repented mm -hmm. of. And that, so that's the kind of thing I think you're yeah. talking about. Absolutely. Whereas, don't look just at the 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 fruit. Surface level. What's the root? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the for parents, I'm speaking like about my personal life, but I think a lot of parents might hear themselves in that. Sometimes we get angry at kids when they disturb or scream at each other or do something, and then I think we're Parents, like, sometimes in the midst of chaos, we're looking for peace and comfort. And then kids, most of the time, they come and disrupt They disrupt that. <laughs> and you just get impatient because what is, um, they're an obstacle to that peace and mm -hmm. comfort you want. And it's like, but then you get angry, but you don't understand why, because you love your kids. It's like, but, then, but I think that's a good question. Like, what, like, what was the thing that I was getting after that I did not get? And you were... In the obstacle, you are an obstacle to my mm -hmm. the thing I was really seeking. Yeah, I, mean, I think asking for forgiveness for that makes you like just uh, think a little bit deeper. Oh, sorry, I just got angry. Okay, but why? Mm -hmm. And then yeah, going these layers and mm -hmm. what do I love? What do I prioritize? What do I hold as one of the highest values in my life? I just I have these goals, and you got in the way mm -hmm. of me accomplishing these goals. You question my competency <laughs> to match clothing or, you know, like, or, I, or whatever, right? So I'm just picking on Sean. Now. I'm dressed fine. I'm dressed fine today. <laughs> he, I know he's he can't see me, but I'm doing, I'm doing good today. So. Doing really well. <laughs> the first uh, chapter in Paul Tripp's book on parenting, Whose Idols Are These Anyway? Mm. Oh, man. Okay. There it is. Mm. Yeah. That's why I don't read books on biblical counseling. <laughs> <laughs> Too convicting. Actually, you know, it is funny when we got to the second part. Of the sermon, and I, I always make this joke, so it's like the same old joke for Bree. So she might just like roll her eyes at me at this point, uh, at this point. But like typically, sermons are structured around the like terrible outward cultural manifestations of these things, which Caleb will never do, probably. And then we get to the second point where it like deals with the heart, and I like nudge Bree, and I'm like, I think I'm gonna go check on the kids' ministry right now. <laughs> so wow. church, if you ever see. Pastor Caleb, walk out mid-sermon. You know what's going yes, on. Stop him right. in his tracks. Yeah, the, yeah <laughs> shut the door. Get right back in there, buddy. Uh, you're, you're back. So. so good. Yeah. 
Uh, one thing I, I will touch on uh, just very briefly is there was a point in the sermon yesterday where I had some things just jotted down in my notes and I was I got to it and I'm looking at them and I'm looking at the clock and I'm I don't have time for this and so I'm like restitching my notes together on on the spot um that's you know there's usually like a few trains of thought going through your head while you're preaching especially the more you do it but uh so that was one yesterday and so i cut a chunk on in the moment um uh, on the sermon but one of the things i hadn't thought about till later in the week while preparing was the um just in this sort of history of interpretation of handling these portions of scripture uh this commandment is the first one that's negatively stated so and the rest are as well like six through ten are negatively stated so a lot of students of scripture will talk about the positive expression of the commandment so i just i didn't touch on that yesterday i was thinking about it in terms of uh first john 3 i read some of that about cain and do not murder and those types of things but then john goes on to actually apply that in a really really convicting manner um when he talks about uh those who have when he talks about need um, and talking about loving one another. And so he says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is on the heels of everyone who hates his brother as a murderer. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Hmm. So the, the, the negative expression of the command is don't, don't destroy, don't kill, don't, don't, and then you take the expansion of the Lord or the right interpretation of the Lord in Matthew 5. We can destroy with our words and those types of things. But the positive expression of that commandment is the Good Samaritan. You see someone and uh, you care for them so that they don't, that person would have died. But you're caring for them, you're showing them love in a positive way, which is uh, the positive expression of that commandment. And, uh, and yeah, John is, is uh, it seems John's making that connection in his writing that if we see people in need and we have, we close our heart to them, that's not love. Mm. That's, and, and the, the alternative to that is, well, murder. He's just talking about that a few, a few verses earlier. Mm. Um, and so uh, the, there's some really helpful reflections by Martin Luther on that. He, he says, this commandment is violated not only when a person actually does evil, but also when he fails to do good to his neighbor or though he has the opportunity, fails to prevent, protect, and save him from suffering bodily harm or injury. If you send a person away naked when you could clothe him, you have let him freeze to death. If you see anyone suffer hunger and do not feed him, you have let him starve. Likewise, if you see anyone condemned to death or in similar peril and do not save him, although you know ways and means to do so, you have killed him. It will do you no good to plead that you did not contribute to his death by word and deed, for you have withheld your love from him and robbed him of the service by which his life might have been saved. Hmm. Those are sobering reflections. Uh, and uh, one com one uh, pastor commenting on those, he says, they are sobering words for Christians who live in a culture of death. Media, violence, homicide, rape, abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, warfare, terrorism. The evils are so overwhelming that it is tempting to do nothing at all. But, he writes, we must at least do what we can. We can teach our children how to resolve conflict without resorting to violence. We can pray for peace in the troubled parts of the world. We can intercede on behalf of the unborn, the disabled, and the elderly. We can help save children through adoption and foster care. We can care for the sick and dying. We can send relief to those who are oppressed. We can work to make laws that bring justice and promote life. This is the positive side of the Sixth Commandment. Hmm. Anyway, I just, uh, maybe I should have included them yesterday, but helpful reflections. Um, uh, for I emphasized the negative statement of it yesterday, but there's a positive side of it as well. I think this Sunday I'm going to call the sermon Faithfulness. Nice. Because it, uh, that's what we're talking about. You shall not commit adultery. Mm. So that really is the positive side of the commandment. Yeah. We're not just like looking to abstain from something and avoid something that is negative. We are to live positively a certain way. That's good. Right? So th the negation is actually speaking of a, of, of a positive condition. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this past sermon could, be called, could have been called love. Yes. This one, faithfulness. And then we can kind of go down the Love list. or life, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I think the other Same. positive side is, is we are to be those who, who promote... Um, uh, love promotes life, right? Um, but also, you know... We are to be pro-life in our stance against, um, you know, things like abortion and mm -hmm. all the rest. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
anything that wasn't clear? Anything that could have been better? Was there enough emphasis on the gospel? I spent a lot of time exposing sin. Was that was that clear enough? Were you were you helped and hopeful and walking away from the sermon yesterday, or w- could there have been more on that front? I gauge that by feeling. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain. Um, you know this kind of heavy weight on your chest when you get the word expounded, and it's like, man, I'm guilty. Mm-hmm. And then you get to hear the gospel, it's like, oh, but there's hope. I felt like that. I can describe it, but. Felt it, so. okay, that was the Moses moment. Can relate. Yeah. <laughs> Can relate. <laughs> that was the Moses moment. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's good. And and I think that whenever we go back to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to do again this week, we we go back there and we say, you know, unless your righteousness is yeah. perfect, mm. you know, y- you've got nothing. And you go, okay, I can never attain to that standard. I can never live up to that. And then you look at, you know, you you know any man who looks at a woman with lust in his heart, and you go, oh, man, I, I can't live up to that standard, right? My righteousness is not perfect. Look to the righteousness of another. That's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, which covers you, which is not a, okay, let's sin abound because Jesus is perfect for you. Of course. You know, that changes me. And, it and begins, frees you. Yeah, absolutely. So... That's great. Well, it looks like we're in for more of the same this coming Sunday. I think you did well um, with your pastoral considerations, mm-hmm. you know, the different, I would say, uh, sensitive subjects in our society. You did that well. Um, and within it, our church, right? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting how you lay down, like, how we go with death, beginning, middle, and mm-hmm. end. It's like, it's all over. All over. So mm. it was I think, well done. One person said, you know, how do we... How do we how do we take how do we get this message into the ears of people, right? Like like clearly our culture needs to hear this. So how, how do we how do we do that? How do we? And I love the heart. I love the uh, oh this should be heard in Ottawa. Like you know those yeah. types of things. How do we do that? And I I, mean, I look back at the person. I'm like, well, you're a believer in Christ. You're an ambassador of the gospel. You we we all do this. We in it's the places that. Wherever we go, wherever the Lord sends us, wherever the Lord prompts us to, uh, it, it isn't going to be one sermon in one church on one Sunday. In the, I mean, the Lord could use that, to, but it's all of God's people all together being faithful to preach the gospel and to have spiritual conversations and to not be afraid to step into the topic of abortion or suicide or uh, physician assisted death when it comes up in the workplace or around the dinner table or that's going to take some boldness that's going to take some courage maybe some equipping mm-hmm. uh, so we're we're helped to know what what would be valuable to say but uh, I think that's how we do it there was a great article written by Jeff Chang this week uh, on the gospel coalition uh, maybe it was maybe it wasn't just this week um, Spurgeon was once asked how he got his congregation did you see this um, oh, yeah. because he had a uh, you, do you send it to me? I sent it to you. Whatever. I'm just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> um, uh, let me just pull it up really quickly. Uh, the, I yeah, wrote it. You wrote it. Whatever. <laughs> uh, Jeff Chang is your uh, yeah. is your pen no, name. Your pen yeah. name. Unlikely. That's your artist name. <laughs> um, Interesting. I'm a choice. professor at Midwestern. <laughs> yeah. With a PhD. Let me pull it up really quickly. So, so, so someone was asked. Um, this version had a sizable congregation, and there were lots of people that came to faith uh, through the efforts of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And um, he was asked one time how he got his congr- congregation. And uh, he says, somebody asked me how I got my congregation. I never got it at all. I did not think it my business to do so, but only to preach the gospel. Why? My congregation got my congregation. Mm. That is fantastic. Say and that say it again. My congregation got my congregation. It's on board. <laughs> uh, a noise that Spurgeon probably never heard in his life. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> um, I love that sentiment in that uh, there is certainly a personal evangelism component where we we live out and we tell the truth of the gospel wherever we are. 
but there's a, also a congregational component to it mm-hmm. as well, that whenever the church gathers, we're all of us telling the gospel together. Yes. And you prayed that way, actually, on Sunday, by the way, that, didn't you? By the way we love one another, that people would see there's something different here that is actually the power of the gospel on display, and this is evidence that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So the, 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 the conversion of the nation isn't on any one individual's shoulders, uh, but think about the people that you know in your life that you could maybe invite to Christianity Explored starting this coming week. But then when we think about we all gather together and we're doing and saying something together, and I don't know we always consider that congregational aspect of mm. evangelism. And we can, we can invite people to church, as it happened this past Sunday, people going to the market and bringing people in, and they can see something Mm-hmm. that we hope and pray is different from the world around us, and that is the congregation telling the gospel. And uh, so, uh, yeah, if you're burdened by the things that we're seeing in our culture, we really have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, well, how am I being salt and light? In what ways is that happening? And how am I communicating the truth and hope of the gospel? Because we all do have a responsibility for that. So, mm-hmm. I, I love the way that I think maybe one of the most pivotal extra biblical books that's been written in the last uh, 10 years uh, puts it, you know, Carl Truman asks in his book, like, how have we gotten as a society to the state where, you know, a, a, a man can be standing in front of you and claim that he's a woman, right? And he's like, we, we have obviously sunk to an all new low. And he, he goes and he diagnoses the problem and he goes into history and he does a deep dive about the progression of thought and how autonomy has like led to this disaster of a situation. And then in his conclusion, he says, so how are we going to deal with this? And it's simply this. I, I need to be a faithful Christian. I need to be more committed to the local church. Mm. I need to, I need to um, laud and worship and adore the Lord Jesus Christ more. And so it, my faithfulness in my life, we never think this, my faithfulness in my life is pervasive. Mm-hmm. It is societal. And actually, the sin in my life is societal Same. as well, yeah. right? Like like our complacency, our laziness, our spiritual apathy affects other people in the congregation. And uh, we don't think often about the communal ramifications for the negative and for the positive with respect to sin and sanctification. That's good. I think that's it. We'll wrap up there. Thanks for joining us. Anything happening this week? Pray for Caleb. He's preaching. Pray for Pastor Kevin, who's still not around the table. We long for our brother to be back in our midst, so Mm. pray for his continued recovery. What else this week? Come to the evening service, some teaching on prayer. Yes, we're switching Mm. to a prayer format on Sunday evening. Come and find out why.